from Austin, Texas, it's The Cube, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and The Cube's ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live here in Austin, Texas. This is The Cube's exclusive coverage of the Cloud Native Conference and KubeCon for Kubernetes Conference. This is from the Linux Foundation. This is The Cube. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media. My co-host, Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Justin Kirkland, Vice President of Product at Ubuntu Canonical. Welcome to The Cube. Thank you, John. So you're the product guy. You get the keys to the kingdom, as they always say in the product circles. Um, Man, what a best time to be They in. always say that, I don't think I've heard that one. Uh, well, the product guys are, all the action's <laughs> happening on the product side. Um, We're right so, in the middle of it. Because you got to have a roadmap, you got to have a 20 mile stair on the, on the next you know, horizon while you go sure. out into the, into the pasture and, and deliver value. Yep. But you always got to be watching for and always making decisions on what to do, when to ship product, now you got the cloud, things are happening right. at a very accelerated rate, and then you got to bring it out to the customers. That's right. So you got kind of, you're living on, both sides of the world, you got to look inside, you got to look outside. Well, all three, there's the marketing angle too, which is what we're doing, uh, we're doing here right now. So yeah. there's engineering, sales, and this is the marketing. All right, so where are we with this? Because now you guys have always been on the front lines of open source, great track record, everyone knows the history there. What are the new things? What's the big aha moment that this event, largest they've had ever, third, not even three years old, Yep, it's Why great to, happening? I love seeing these events in my hometown, Austin, Texas, so it's, uh, I hope we, hope we keep coming back. The aha moment is how application development is fundamentally changing. Uh, cloud Native is, the, is the, the title of the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and Cloud Native Conference here. What does Cloud Native mean? You know, it's a different form of writing applications. Just before we were talking about systems programming, right? That's not exactly Cloud Native. Uh, cloud Native programming is writing to uh, APIs that are cloud exposed APIs, integrating with software as a service, creating applications that have no intelligence whatsoever about what's under, underneath them, right? Yeah. But taking advantage of that in all the ways that you would, you would want and expect in a modern application. Fault tolerance, mm -hmm. automatic updates, hyper security, just security, security, security. Uh, that is the aha moment, that the, the way applications are being developed is fundamentally changing. Interesting perspective we had on earlier, Lou Tucker from Cisco, legend, yep. obviously had some stuff in the Computer History Museum, CTO at Cisco, and we had Kelsey Hightower, uh, co-chair for this conference, and also you know, very active in the community. Yet, and the perspective, I'll oversimplify and generalize it, but basically was, hey, this stuff's been going on for 30 years, it's just different now, and so like, Tell us the old way and new way, because the old way, you're kind of describing it, you got to build your own stuff, full stack, build all parts of the stack, and do a lot of stuff that you didn't want to do. Yeah, right? yeah. And now you have more, maybe potentially time on your hands, right. if DevOps and infrastructure as code starts to happen. Sure. But doesn't mean that networking goes away, doesn't mean that storage goes no. away, that some new lines are forming. Yeah. Describe that dynamic of the, what's new in the new way, and what what's changes from the old way. Yeah, I think we've, we've kind of, Virtualization has brought about a different way of thinking about resources. Be those compute resources, chopping CPUs up into virtual CPUs, that's KVM VMware. Uh, you mentioned network and storage. Now we virtualize both of those into software-defined storage and software-defined networking, right? Uh, we have things like OpenStack that bring that all together from an infrastructure perspective, and we now have Kubernetes that really brings that to bear from an application perspective. Kubernetes thinks about helps you think about applications in a different way. I said the paradigm has changed. It's Kubernetes that helps implement that paradigm so that developers can write an application to, uh, to a, a, a container orchestrator like Kubernetes and take advantage of many of the advances we've made below that layer in the, in the operating system and in the, the cloud itself. Um, so from that perspective, you know, the game has changed and the way you write your application is not the same as the monolithic app we might have written on an IBM uh, mm -hmm. or a, a traditional system. Yeah, Dustin, you say monolithic app versus, oh my gosh, the multi-layered cake that we have today. <laughs> um, we, we were talking in the, about the keynote this morning where you know, just CNCF got, went from four projects to 14 projects. You know, you got Kubernetes, you got things like Istio on top. Help us tease out a little bit, what are the ones that, you know, wh where's Canonical engaged, what are you hearing from customers, you know, what are they excited about, what are they still looking for? Yeah, you know, I, in a somewhat self-serving way, I'll, I'll use this opportunity to explain exactly what we do uh, in, in helping build that, that layer cake. You know, it starts with the OS, you know, we provide a great operating system, Ubuntu, that you know, every developer would, would certainly know and understand and appreciate. That's the kernel, that's the systemd, that's the hypervisor, that's all the storage and drivers that makes 
the operate, operating system work well on hardware, lots of hardware, IBM, Dell, HP, Intel, all the rest, as well as in virtual machines, the public clouds, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, uh, VMware, and, and others. So we take care of that operating system perspective. Um, within the CNCF and within the, the Kubernetes ecosystem, it really starts with the Kubernetes distribution. So we provide a Kubernetes distribution, we call it Canonical's Distribution of Kubernetes, CDK, uh, which is open source Kubernetes with security patches applied, that's it. No special sauce, no extra, uh, extra proprietary extensions. It is open source Kubernetes, the reference platform for open source Kubernetes, 100% conformant. Now, once you have a Kubernetes, as you say, you know, what, do, what are you hearing from customers? We hear a lot of customers who want a Kubernetes. Once they have a Kubernetes, the next question is, now what do I do with it, okay? If they have applications that their developers have been writing to Google's Kubernetes engine, GKE, or Amazon's Kubernetes engine, the new one announced last week at reInvent, uh, AKS, uh, or uh, Microsoft's Kubernetes engine, AK, uh, yeah, Microsoft's AKS, yes. uh, Amazon's EKS. Okay. Yeah. A lot of TLAs out there Thank always. Thank you for the yes. TLA dissection. <laughs> uh, if you've written the applications already, having your own Kubernetes is great because then your applications simply port and run on that and we help customers get there. However, if you haven't written your first application, that's where actually most of the industry is today. They want a Kubernetes but they're not sure why. So to that end, we're helping bring some of the interesting workloads that exist, open source workloads, and putting those on top of Canonical Kubernetes. Yesterday we press released a new product from Canonical launched in conjunction with our partners at Rancher Labs, which is the cloud native platform. The cloud native platform is Ubuntu plus Kubernetes plus Rancher. That combination we've heard from customers and from users of Ubuntu inside and out, everyone's interested in a developer workflow that includes open source Ubuntu, open source Kubernetes, and open source Rancher, uh, which really accelerates the velocity of development. And that end-to-end -end solution provides exactly that, and it helps populate that Kubernetes with really interesting workloads. Yeah, uh, Dustin, so you know, we, we know Shang, Shannon, and the team, uh, they know a thing or two about uh, building stacks with open source. Yes. Uh, we've talked with you many times at OpenStack. Maybe give us a little bit of kind of compare and contrast what we've been doing with OpenStack, which you know, Canonical, you know, very heavily involved, at, you know, doing great there, uh, versus kind of the, the, the cloud native stack here. Right, if you know Shannon and Shang, you, I think you can understand and appreciate why uh, Mark, myself, and the rest of the Canonical team are really excited about this partnership. We really see eye to eye on open source principles first, deliver open source, great open source experiences first, um, and then taking that to market with a product that revolves around support. Ultimately, uh, developer adoption up front is what's important, and some of, those, uh, some of those developer applications will make its way into production in a mission critical sense, which open up support opportunities for, for both of us. And we certainly see eye to eye from, uh, from that perspective. Uh, what we bring to bear is the Ubuntu ecosystem of developers, the Ubuntu OpenStack, infrastructure as a service, where we've seen many of the world's largest organizations uh, de deploying their OpenStacks, doing so on Ubuntu and with Ubuntu OpenStack. Uh, with the launch of Kubernetes and canonical Kubernetes, many of those same organizations are running their own Kubernetes alongside OpenStack, or in some cases, on top of OpenStack. Um, in a very few cases, instead of OpenStack, in, in very special cases, often at the edge or in, in certain, uh, certain tiny cloud or micro cloud scenarios. Uh, in all of these, we see Rancher as a really, really good partner in helping to accelerate that developer workflow. Uh, enabling developers to write code, commit code to a GitHub repository with full GitHub integration, authenticate against an active directory uh, with, with full RBAC controls, everything that you would need in an inter enterprise to bring that application to bear from concept to development to test into production, and then the life cycle once it gains its own life in, in production. What about the, um, the impact to customers? So, I'm an IT guy or I'm an architect, and man, all this new stuff's coming at me. I love my open source, it's got, I'm, I'm happy, with, it's big, it's, don't want to touch it, I want to break it, oh, but I want to innovate. This whole world can be a little bit noisy and new to, new to them. Yep. How do, you, how do you have that conversation with that uh, potential customer or customer where you say, look, we can get there. Yep. Here's your app team, here's what you want to shape up to be, here's service meshes and pluggable, well, pluggable architectures, I can plug it. So again, 
How do you simplify that when you have conversations? What's the, what's the narrative, what's the conversation like? Yeah, usually, the, usually our introduction into the organization, the Fortune 500 company, is by the developers inside of that company who already know Ubuntu, who already have some experience with Kubernetes or have some experience with, with Rancher or any of those so other. So it's bottoms up. Yeah, it's situation. bottoms up, absolutely, absolutely. The developer network around Ubuntu is far bigger than the, the, the organization that is canonical. So that helps us with the intro. Uh, once we're in there, and the developers you know, write those first few apps, we do, we do get uh, the introductions to their IT director, who then wants that, that comfy blanket. You know, customer support, maybe 24 by What's 7 What's the experience or like? Five. Is it like going to the airport and going through TSA, and you got to take your shoes off, take your belt <laughs> off? I mean, what kind of inspection? What is kind of the culture? Because, I mean, they want to move fast, but they got to be sure. And this right. has always been the challenge when you have the internal advocates saying, look, we want to go this way, and this is more the, going to be more the reality yeah. for companies. Developers are, are, are now major influencers, yep. not just some, you know, here's the product, we made a decision and they ship it to them. Yep. It's shifted. Right. If there's one thing that I've learned in this, uh, this sort of product, product management uh, assignment, and you know, I'm an engineer as, as, by trade, but as a, as a product manager now for almost five years, it's that you really have to look at the different verticals, and some verticals move at vastly different paces than other verticals. Uh, when we're in the telco space, we're in RFIs, uh, you know, requests for, for a quote or requests for information uh, that may last months, nine months, and then go entering into a procurement process that may last another nine months. And we're talking about 18 months in an industry here that you know, is spinning up. You're, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about how fast this goes, uh, which is vastly different than the work we do in Silicon Valley, right? With, with some of the largest dot coms uh, in, in the world that are built on Ubuntu, maybe in AWS or, or elsewhere. Their adoption curve is significantly different, and the procurement angle is really different. What they're looking to buy often uh, on the on the U.S. West Coast is not so much support, but they're looking for uh, they're looking to guide your roadmap. And so we have we offer for customers of that size and scale uh, a different set of products, something we call feature sponsorships, where those customers are less interested in 24 by 7 telephone support and far more interested in sponsoring certain features into Ubuntu itself and helping drive the Ubuntu roadmap. We offer both of those as products and different verticals buy in different ways. We talk to media and entertainment and the conversation's completely different. Oil and gas, conversation's completely different. So by vertical, okay, so what are you doing here? What's the big um, effort at, at uh, uh, Cloud Native Con? Yeah, so, yeah so we've got a, a great booth and we're, we're talking about Ubuntu as uh, a pretty universal platform for almost anything you're doing in the cloud, whether that's on-prem infrastructure as a service, OpenStack, uh, you know, we, we, we still have, you know, people can poo-poo OpenStack and uh, point OpenStack versus Kubernetes against one another. We, we could not see it more differently. Well, no, I think it's more, it's more that it's, you've got clarity on where the, where the community's lines are because apps guys are moving off OpenStack, but that's natural. Right. It's really found a home, OpenStack, very relevant. Oh, without a doubt. Huge production workloads. I talk to Jonathan Price about this all the time. Yeah. I mean, there's no poo-pooing OpenStack. Right. I mean, it's not like it's hurting. Right, right. I it, mean, just to clarify, OpenStack is not going anywhere. It's just that you know, there's been some you know, comments about OpenStack refugees going to, but they're going there anyway. That's right. up the stack. Right. And we offer, that, we offer lots. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. We, and that, that, choice is, that choice is there on Ubuntu. So infrastructure is a service. OpenStack's a fantastic platform. Uh, platforms as a service are cloud native, true cloud native development. Kubernetes is an excellent platform. We see those running side by side. Two racks of systems or a single rack. Half of those machines are OpenStack, half of those are Kubernetes, and the same IT department manages both. Uh, we, see, uh, we see IT departments that are all in on OpenStack. Their entire data center is OpenStack, and we see Kubernetes as one workload inside of that OpenStack. How do you see Kubernetes impact on containers? A lot of people are poo-pooing containers, huh. but they're not going anywhere well, no, either. Yeah. So, but the, it's fundamental. The ecosystem's know? changing. Certainly the roles of each part, microservices is exploding. How do you talk about that? What is, what's your opinion on how containers are evolving? Containers are evolving, but they've been around for, for a very long time as well, right? Um, Kubernetes has helped bring con make containers consumable, you know, and Docker to an extent before that. Um, the work we've done around Linux containers, LXC, LexD as well, all of those technologies are are fundamental to it, and it, it takes tight integration with the OS. Yeah, 
D Dustin, so I'm, I'm curious, one of the big challenges I have, have to think you face is the proliferation of deployments for customers. It's not just data center right. or even cloud. Right. You know, Edge is now a very big piece oh, of it. Okay. I have to think that containers helps enable a little bit of that, you know, kind of cloud native goes there, but you know, what kind of stresses does that put on kind of your product organization? Yeah, it, it, Containers are adding fuel to the fire on both the edge and in the back-end cloud. What's exciting to me about the edge is that every edge device, every connected device is connected to something. What's it connected to? A cloud somewhere, and that can be an OpenStack cloud or a, combination, or a Kubernetes cloud, that can be a public cloud, that can be a private implementation of that cloud. But every connected device, whether it's a car, uh, or a plane, or a train, or a printer, or a drone, is connected to something, and it's connected to a bunch of services. We see containers being deployed on Ubuntu on those edge devices, right, as the, as the packaging format, as the application format, as the multi-tenancy layer that keeps one application from DOSing, or, or attacking, or, or you know, being protected from another application on that edge device. We also see containers running the microservices in the, in the cloud on Ubuntu there as well. Um, the edge to me is extremely interesting in how it ties back to the cloud. And to be, to be, to be transparent here, Canonical's strategy and Canonical's play is actually quite strong here with Ubuntu providing quite a bit of consistency across those, those two layers. So developers working on those applications on those devices are often sitting right next to the developers working on those applications in the cloud and both of them are seeing Ubuntu uh, helping them go faster. Bottom line, where do you see this industry going? How do you guys fit into the next three years? What's your prediction? Yeah, so that, I think, I'm going to go right back to what I was saying right there. The, the connection between the edge and the cloud is our angle right there, and there's, there's nothing that's stopping that right now. I mean, we were just talking with uh, Joe Bita, and our view is, well, if it's a distributed computing world, everything's an edge. Yeah, that's right. right. So, I mean, that's, that's exactly <laughs> data right. Data center's an edge. Yeah. Uh, a, a light in a house is an edge with a process in it. Yeah, so I think I the mean, data centers are getting smarter. You wanted a prediction for next year. Uh, the prediction, the, the, the data center is getting smarter. We're seeing autonomous data centers. We see data centers using metal as a service mass yeah. to automatically provision those systems uh, and, and, and manage those systems in a way that makes that hardware look like a cloud. AI and IoT, certainly two topics that are really hot trends that are very relevant. It's changing storage and networking. Those industries have to transform. Amazon's telegraphy, things like Lambda and serverless. You're seeing, starting to see the infrastructure as code take shape. Yeah, and that, that's what sits on top of Kubernetes. That's what's driving Kubernetes adoption are those AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence workloads. Uh, a lot of the media and transcoding workloads yeah. are taking advantage of Kubernetes yeah. every day. Bottom line, that's software. <laughs> <laughs> Good software, smart software. That's right. Dustin, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Congratulations on uh, uh, continued developer success. Um, good to have a great ecosystem. You guys have been successful for a very long time and as the world continues to be democratized with software as it gets smarter, more pervasive and cloud computing, grid computing, unigrid, whatever it's called, it is all driven by software and cloud. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, it's theCUBE live coverage from Austin, Texas here at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2017. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more after this short break. <laughs>